can start now. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Brian Nozick from Virginia University. And if uh, any one of you uh, find Professor Nozick uh, familiar, it is probably because he was already here with us several months ago, but uh, on the desktop of Lilia's uh, PC <laughs> during the defense of PhD uh, thesis. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, Professor Nozick for his kind acceptance to be uh, part of the uh, evaluation committee for, uh, for Lilia's thesis. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Nozick for coming today and giving us uh, uh, the lecture titled uh, Scientific Utopia, Opening Scientific uh, Communication and Improving Scientific Practices. In this lecture, uh, uh, Professor Mozek uh, will tell us about the hot current discussion in uh, our science about our current scientific practices with special emphasis on the issue of very hot issue of replicability of the results published in major major journals. Uh, but before uh, before giving uh, floor to Professor uh, Nozick, uh, I am giving uh, floor to Lilia, and she will tell us a, uh, a few will give us few information about Professor Nozick. Okay. Um, um, thank you all for coming. Um, uh, I hope this will be interesting for all of us, uh, and I'm sure about that. Uh, I hope so too. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would like to thank you for coming here, and also, first of all, I would like to thank you a lot because you um, agreed to participate um, as part of the evaluation committee, and for giving um, very useful comments, um, and uh, hopefully uh, we will have a fruitful discussion after this lecture. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of Psychology, um, uh, and the Department of Psychology, uh, we invited Professor Nozick to come to Belgrade. Um, well, if you go uh, on the internet and look um, about Vita of, uh, of our <coughs> guest today, you will see that it's, uh, it's like dozens of pages, and uh, I will uh, tell you just a few information. Um, he graduated from Yale uh, University, and after he continued his career at the top universities of the uh, States. Um, if I read correctly, uh, you have published more than 90, uh, you have more than 90 references, uh, papers, uh, conference proceedings, and uh, other formats uh, in top journals of the world. Uh, he's also, uh, he was also awarded with uh, several prizes. I will just mention two, and I will uh, read the names because it's, uh, I don't want to make a mistake. One was uh, the uh, early awards from the International Science uh, International Social Cognition Network and the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, right? So, um, it would be, uh, it can take like um, an hour probably uh, just telling about uh, his curriculum, but um, I will now give the floor to you, so um, enjoy all, and um, it will be a great pleasure to, to uh, listen to the lecture and to have a discussion after. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to have been invited and have a chance to uh, visit the university and, and continue the collaborative exchange that started uh, maybe two or three years ago uh, with, with some of you here. Uh, so thank you for coming to the lecture. Uh, what I'd like to uh, speak about today is not about any particular scientific evidence or theory, but rather about how it is we do our science. Uh, what practices we have in trying to build a, a base of scientific knowledge that might uh, slow us down or get in the way of doing it as productively or as efficiently as possible. Uh, I, I will say up, up front that I can, I can get overexcited, so if I accelerate too quickly in my speech, please raise your hands and slow me down. Uh, and I, I'm also happy to be interrupted uh, any time with questions uh, for discussion. I don't have any uh, concern about, about interruption, so please feel free uh, to do that. But uh, let me begin uh, at, at what I perceive as the beginning, 
uh, of what it is we are doing here as uh, psychological scientists or scientists in general. Uh, and that is to accumulate a body of knowledge, understanding of nature, of minds, of, of humans, of other species, of, of how is it that we work and what is it that we do. This is the, the basic goal of what science is about, is learning things, taking us from perfect ignorance uh, about the world to some kind of understanding. Well, while we may never get to perfect understanding, each time we do some uh, kind of investigation, we learn a little bit more. Now, the goal of science is also a goal of scientists, right? us as individuals. But we individually, as we do uh, our science, have additional goals. Right? In not just to accumulate knowledge for the purity of knowledge sake, but we also would like to get a job. We'd also like to keep that job. We want to earn the rewards and accolades of having done a, a great job at what we do. Uh, and many of us derive some sort of satisfaction, some feelings of worth from the science that we do. Uh, and so these are additional goals. They're good goals. They're goals that I have and I want to be, uh, have all of these things. I need these things. Uh, but those things uh, add additional baggage uh, to what it is that scientists do in contributing to the first goal, accumulating knowledge about nature. And so we have a number of things that we do to achieve these goals, right, of, of being productive scientists. And uh, part of this may be uh, more relevant in research intensive settings. So particularly, you know, so the context that I come from obviously is the United States uh, and from uh, the types of universities where the primary basis of reward in that university is research uh, productivity. And so I would be interested in, in discussion to the extent to which you see these same uh, pressures for individual performers uh, operating uh, in, uh, in this environment. But the primary means uh, that students uh, in our programs, that young faculty in our programs, and then senior faculty in our programs have to achieve the goals uh, of the prior page of what it means to be a successful scientist are one, to publish. Right? To, to do research and to publish it in, in journals. Uh, we also need to publish, uh, do research and publish it in top journals, and, and we also need to publish, uh, do some research and publish it in top journals. Uh, there are obviously other things uh, that influence our careers, right? If we are very good teachers, if we're good administratively, if we're excellent advisors, uh, but those are local performance things. For scientists in the broader scope, of what is it that we're awarded for in science, uh, it almost, is almost entirely uh, in our kinds of environments, uh, the extent to which and the kinds of publications that we have, uh, and the impact that those have. So this raises a challenge for what it is that we're doing in our everyday science uh, in order to accumulate knowledge. Because not everything gets published, right? You know as well as I do that some things are more publishable than other things. So, for example, it is easier to publish novel results than replications uh, of results that others have claimed to be true or false. Right? It is easier to publish positive results, rejecting the null hypothesis at p less than 0.05, than not doing that. Right? It's easier to publish results that are clean, tidy, very nice. The story is coherent. Everything fell into place as it should, <coughs> rather than complex. <coughs> uncertain, right, with variation, right? And then it is easier to publish a result where you knew it all along, and you said, this is what's gonna happen, and that's what happens, uh, a confirmatory result, rather than one where you just discovered it along the way. It was the product of an exploration of, of analysis. So we have a divide between what's easier to publish and what's harder to publish. The challenge is that this creates a conflict of interest for me as a scientist trying to have success in my research because true results, what's actually the product of research, what we actually learn, are not always the things that are easier to publish. A lot of our research results that are accurate research results are things that we would learn from that are things that, acute, that contribute to our body of knowledge are whether we can replicate it or not. Are results where a relationship doesn't exist, a negative result, rather than a relationship that does exist, right? Where it's complicated, 
We are studying things that are on the boundaries of knowledge. That's what science is about. We're not studying things where we know how it all works. So we're mucking around trying to figure out how is it that this works. And so most of our results are messy. And we are in places where we don't know a lot of things because that's what where real exciting science happens. Right? But we're working on problems where we don't know the answer. So we have a lot of exploratory research. A lot of what we learn is through discovery. So we have many of our daily activities of actual practice of science in the laboratory is harder to publish, even though that's the reality of it. And so the conflict of interest that I face as a scientist is that I need the items on the left for my results, right? to publish, to succeed, to be advanced in my field. But most of what's happening in my laboratory is the stuff on the right side. It's messy. We don't know what we're doing. We're trying to figure it out. We're not getting effects all the time. <coughs> and things that we try to do aren't replicating when we bother trying to replicate it. Right, so this is a challenge. So the consequences of this conflict of interest, COI, short for conflict of interest, are numerous. So there are um, a couple of uh, very prominent uh, reports in science and nature uh, in the last few years of uh, companies, uh, private companies in, in biomedicine that have tried to replicate results uh, for uh, new promising targets to treat, uh, treat cancer, uh, women's health issues, and a number of other things that are coming out of bio, uh, biomedical laboratories. Uh, and they just tried to do a direct replication of the original result. Uh, and in two different studies, one with maybe 50 uh, replications, another with perhaps 60, uh, they managed to replicate in one case 25% of the original results, and in the other case 11% of the published results. And these, they didn't select results at random, they picked studies that had had a high impact, very promising targets for the treatment of cancer. Some of the uh, original studies that they tried to replicate had spawned hundreds of other studies, uh, but no one had ever bothered to try to replicate the original study to see if it, had, if it was true. Uh, and they weren't able to reproduce those results. And reproducibility is a fundamental tenet of what science is all about. If we can't reproduce the result, then we can't really include it easily in the body of knowledge. Right? Because part of what science is, is it's not dependent on me telling you that this is what the result is, uh, but that I give you the recipe and you can do it yourself. And if you can't do it yourself, then is it really real? <laughs> can we really trust it? So the fact that we're only replicating 25% or 11% of published results in top journals is <coughs> more than alarming to me. It is terrifying that that, that the, those rates are so low. So there is a, conflict, uh, a consequence of a conflict of interest. I need to show novel results, but I don't want to fail to replicate them, so I don't try to replicate them. I just do it once. If I get it, fantastic. I'm never going to do it again, because if I try to do it again and it goes away, I'm not going to be able to publish it. We also know that there is a challenge with positive versus negative results, right? It's easier to publish positive results. And one study of the rate of positive results, so this researcher uh, just went through journals across many scientific disciplines and looked at the percentage of results that are uh, published that were positive results confirming the original hypothesis. And what he found, this is hard to read because there's many here, uh, is that most fields Every field has at least 70% of the papers showed a positive result. But psychology wins, right? We, we were the best. More than 90% of our results were positive results, rejecting the P, of point less, P less than 0.05 uh, and confirming our original hypothesis. Now that is a stunning rate of success. Yes, please. We can, uh, we can interrupt. I see the social sciences in general are better than psychology. Uh, <laughs> think that psychologists are better, or psychologists would like to think that they are better than the other social sciences in this respect, it doesn't seem so. Yeah, yeah, although I guess if you count this as winning, then sure, psychologists win, but you're, you're correct. This is a really interesting challenge. Uh, you know, from physics through psychology, mm -hmm. 
is 85% to 92%. So it's a very small margin. Uh, there are a few fields where you know, space sciences does not have as much of this bias. Uh, but really, there isn't a strong difference uh, from physics through psychology here. Uh, but you're right, there is an interesting uh, gap there that could be a reliable gap. I don't know if it is or not. Uh, but this is all the more amazing that we manage to be right more than 90% of the time when you consider the average power of studies. Right? Power of a, the average power of a study, from we were talking before, uh, uh, Jacob Cohen did original research on showing that psycho psychology studies are notoriously underpowered. Right? They have 50%, 60% power to detect a true effect at P less than 0.05 on average. So if all of our effects were true, everything that we study was true, that's in published journals, then we would anticipate, just based on power, that we would have a positive, 50 to 60 percent of our results would be positive. And we managed to get 95, or 92, or whatever it is. That doesn't make sense. Right? What is it that's happening that's resulting in this? Right? There's a number of potential things happening. One, 